It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The growing alliance between Gulf monarchies and Israel is one of Middle East's most notorious open secrets. Monarchies in the Persian Gulf have long claimed to support the Palestinian struggle while secretly working with U.S. and Israel behind the scenes. Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Qatar have at various times tried to exploit the Palestinian struggle for their own political interests, but in recent years their collaboration with Israel has become more prominent and overt. The war in Syria has brought Gulf regimes and Israel even closer together with both sides supporting anti-government, anti-Iran rebels, including Syria's Al-Qaeda affiliate Al-Nusra Front. In 2017, an Israeli cabinet member admitted that Israeli government collaborates with Saudi Arabia in order to counter the growing influence of Iran. The Israeli's intelligence affairs minister even invited Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to visit Israel. These Gulf regimes, like Israel, are key allies and proxies of the United States in the region. They have been for a long time. The Bush era compounded the alliances and the election of President Donald Trump has only accelerated these growing relations. There were even reports that Saudi Arabia and Egypt gave Trump the green light to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. And Bahrain likewise normalized Trump's move by promptly sending a delegation to Jerusalem. To discuss what lies beneath these alliances and warming of relations, I'm joined by Assad Abu Khalil. He is a leading expert on Middle East politics and a professor of political science at California State University in Stanislaus. And he regularly writes at his website, the Angry Arab News Service. I thank you so much for joining us today, Assad. Thank you. Assad, what official relations exist between the Gulf monarchs and Israel? It is fair to say that there is a strong alliance, political, military, intelligence alliance between the United States, between Saudi Arabia, Israel, and we can include UAE, because UAE has been at the forefront of a covert, strong military intelligence alliance with Israel since after September 11. Saudi Arabia has expedited the race to closer relationship with Israel since the rise of the current Crown Prince, but it began long before 2015 when a new king was inaugurated, and it started after September 11 when Saudi Arabia felt that the best way to achieve forgiveness from the public of the United States and from Congress for the involvement of Saudi citizens in September 11 was to getting closer relations with the Israelis and the Israeli lobby. This has been the recipe of all Arab governments, Qatar included. Whenever they want to ingratiate themselves with the U.S. administration, any U.S. administration, they basically get closer to the state of Israel. However, there is a much longer history to secret covert ties between Israel and Saudi Arabia that we can speak of. So there has been different phases to Saudi-Israeli alliances. Back in the first Yemen war of the 1960s, we have seen, and there is now evidence, I have written about that in Arabic, uh, there is evidence now published uh, about covert relations between the Saudis and the Israelis. The Saudis approached the Israelis in India, in Bombay at the time, and that began a direct military Israeli and intelligence intervention in the Yemeni war of course, on the side of the right-wing reaction side in that war. Now, Assad, uh, it is commonly believed that in the 60s and 70s, leftist Palestinian resistance leaders stressed that their enemy was not just Israel, but also what they call reactionary Arab regimes. Has this situation changed, and is those assumptions correct? Unfortunately, it wasn't even that at that time. And this is one of the arguments I used to have as a youngster with many of these uh, leading figures of the Palestinian left-wing movements. Uh, first of all, mainstream PLO organization, the Fatah organization of Yash Arafat, never 
argued that line at all. If anything, the bulk of the PLO was at, on the payroll of the Saudis and the Gulf government. And in return, they basically went along the line of giving more concession to Israel and adopting the two-state solution officially in 1974. Uh, so... We're talking about the left-wing organization. Left-wing organization were not in agreement on that subject. It is true, the PFLP, the main left-wing organization, which was founded in 1967, began, began as an organization that split Arab regimes into different camps and targeting Saudi Arabia as a reactionary regime. But over the years, they slackened in that rhetoric. And some left-wing organization even established covert secret financial relations with the Gulf government. Some of them, some of the Gulf government paid protection money to some, certainly they did that to Fatah organization, but they also paid it to smaller groups. And as a result of that, the Palestinian movement really did not uh, continue what it started preaching in terms of hostility to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf regime. And they pretty much left them alone. Uh, there was no attempt uh, to direct any of the military attacks at the time against Gulf targets. Uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia, the rhetoric uh, and the PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, they continued to refer to Saudi Arabia as a reactionary regime and so on, but there was nothing done about that. Uh, Fatah went even farther. Uh, while the PFLP had ties with opposition groups in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, Fatah was even rendering service against dissidents of the Gulf. We remember in the late 1970s, an arm of the Fatah organization, loyal to Yasser Arafat, kidnapped uh, the most famous Saudi dissident, Nasr al Said, from Beirut when he was on his way for an appointment. They put him in the trunk of a car. They surrendered him to the Saudi embassy in Beirut, from which he was taken and presumably tortured and killed. Now, Assad, I know that the conflicts and contradictions inside the GCC has been there for a long time. Uh, it's historic. But they've come to light over Qatar recently, exposing that they are not this collaborative, cohesive body that comes together around oil. Saudi Arabia and the UAE imposed a blockade on Qatar and uh, broke off their political relations, diplomatic ties. This uh, rift in the GCC has created an interesting divide between Israel's supporters uh, of the Gulf states, where you have had uh, uh, figures such as Rabbi uh, Shmuley, who has attacked uh, Alan Dershowitz and accused him of being soft on Qatar. Now, what does this kind of dynamic reflect? Well, first of all, we need to remember this. There has never been unity among these Gulf governments, never. I mean, the idea of establishing the GCC after the Iranian revolution was not even an indigenous idea. This was an order from the United States in order to facilitate its military and intelligence intervention in the region and to establish a solid uh, block against Iran and its influence in the region. Uh, between all these governments, there has been historical conflict, border and otherwise, between Saudi Arabia and UAE, between Saudi Arabia and Oman, between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, between Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. All of these governments have conflict amongst each other. The unity, as far as it was advertised, has always been fake and has always been a command by the United States which sponsors all these regimes after the collapse of the British Empire. As far as the recent conflict, certainly there has been an unprecedented open conflict between Qatar on the one hand and Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain on the other hand, and Oman stayed at a neutral place and largely unsympathetic to Saudi Arabia for many reasons, while Kuwait has also remained neutral in a way that upset the Saudis and the Saudi media have been filled with scorn against the Kuwaiti government, reminding them that the Saudi government was the one that rescued the Kuwaiti throne after the invasion of Kuwait by Saddam in 1990. What is happening now between Qatar on the one hand and its rivals on the other hand is a race to the heart of the Israeli lobby. They all figure the best way to ingratiate yourself 
with the U.S. administration is twofold. One, you invest more of your money in the United States. I mean, as we all know, the proceeds of Gulf and gas in that region, all most of it comes back to the United States in terms of treasury bonds, in terms of cash reserves in U.S. bank, and in terms of investment in the United States. Qatar already has $100 billion investment in the United States. And they announced recently that if the United States were to help in mediating the conflict, they will invest even more. And notice how after the rise of Trump, Saudi Arabia, which was very concerned about Trump because he had a history of speaking ill against Saudi Arabia, signed, it, I mean, announced an arms deal of worth $110 billion and more is on the horizon. And Qatar announced an arms deal of $24 billion and more on the horizon. And the second part of how they ingratiate themselves is by getting close to the Israeli lobby and by expediting normalization with the occupation state of Israel. So Qatar is doing that. It invited a slew of the most fanatic Zionist Islamophobe here in this country, like Alan Dershowitz, to come to Qatar. And, you know, uh, for like a very expensive and generous trip to those regions, they are willing to come back, both sides, those who support Saudi Arabia and those who support Qatar. After a few days, they are willing to come back and declare that Qatar or Saudi Arabia are uh, full-fledged democracies and they are fighting terrorism and they need to be closer to the United States. Uh, so it's basically, it's like the DC think tank scene. They are at the will and service of Gulf governments in return for funding. Now, I saw these historical relations you refer to between, say, Israel, United States, and the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia in, uh, in particular, uh, which led to, you know, shortly after President Trump was inaugurated, his trip first trip was to Saudi Arabia. How has the election of Donald Trump played into all of this? I mean, the fact that Donald Trump is now uh, a very close ally of the Saudi regime, the fact that Saudi Arabia was the first destination of a foreign trip by Donald Trump tells you that the closeness between the United States and Saudi Arabia is not entirely about oil, and it's not certainly about the Bush family. Obama was no less supportive of the Saudi regime than his predecessor. Every president since FDR has been very close to the Saudi regime, including the self-described human rights president, Jimmy Carter. They all heaped praise on the Saudi regime, despite its atrocious human rights record. In the case of uh, Obama, I mean, the first year, there's a picture still of him on the internet where he is bowing down literally to the Saudi king, uh, Abdullah, at the time. Uh, after September 11, there certainly were trouble in the relationship. There was more scrutiny of Saudi financial expenditure that re reached into the pockets of fanatical groups worldwide. However, American record on that subject is hypocritical at best, because it is true Saudi Arabia has been involved for much of the history of the Cold War in funding and forming a network of fanatical Muslims from around the world as a way to face off against progressives, leftists, communists, and socialists. But Saudi Arabia never did that alone and never did that on its whim. It was part of a coordinated effort with the United States and with Western power, who at that time wanted to create an alternative to the more dominant, secular, progressive, feminist, socialist, communist trends and movements throughout the Middle East. So there is a long history of American dirty involvement in that regard. After September 11, and shortly before that, the United States decided since the collapse of the Soviet Union that they've had enough of these fanatical groups, especially that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, many of them wanted to turn their gun their guns against the United States. And that's when the problems occurred. I mean, according to Economist magazine, bin Laden had ties with the American, continued maybe up to 1994 in some forms in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and elsewhere. Uh, the United States woke up to the danger of these groups much later than it gives itself credit uh, to. Uh, so Saudi Arabia, after September 11, had to explain itself to the American Congress media and the public 
And it did so by basically uh, spending lavishly on PR campaigns, signing more arms deal, and also getting closer to Israel, and uh, making declarations about how they represent moderate Islam and the fact that they will uh, no more uh, stop the American peace process. So there was a price to pay. But certainly it was much more about oil. I mean, look, the percentage of oil we get from Saudi Arabia today is extremely negligible, if any. And there is now shale oil sources coming to the United States. America is going to surpass Saudi Arabia as the top producer of oil. Having said that, we cannot lose sight of the value of Saudi Arabia to the United States on oil prices by virtue of their control within OPEC of production of oil, and that results in changes in prices. So they have been very obedient in that regard to U.S. interests. The second record is Saudi Arabia has become now a, a strategic partner of America and Israel in the region. They are now part of the counter-revolutionary coalition. Uh, and this has been the case since during the Cold War. Saudi Arabia either funds or arms or both the most reactionary groups in the region, along with Israel and the United States and Western powers, in order to thwart any revolutionary potential in Arab countries. And that is the case, you know, that was the case during the Cold War. That has been the case since the so-called Arab uprisings of 2011, where Saudi Arabia has been highly instrumental in undermining any potential progressive anti-Israeli trend in those uprisings, and any democratic trends for sure. And finally, Assad, what does all of this mean for the prospect of some kind of peace and settlement in Israel and in Palestine? Well, I think we should, uh, we should distinguish between what it does to Palestine and what it does to the so-called American peace process. The peace process is contrary to everything uh, that the Palestinians have aspired to over the decades in their struggle for independence. The peace process is basically a name for a process that legitimized Israeli war crimes, occupation, and massacre. As far as the Palestinians are concerned, there is a war on the Palestinians today. Arab, Arab governments and Israel and the United States and Western powers are all part of the unusual, horrific war being inflicted on the Palestinian people, both in the diaspora as well in occupied Palestine and, and uh, the refugee camps where they live in neighboring countries outside of Palestine. Uh, the Gulf countries today are doing great services to the state of Israel. We know that UAE basically hosted the Mossad terrorists who came to kill a Hamas leader a few years ago. And the media of the Gulf and Saudi Arabia controls pretty much close to 95% of all Arab media, either directly or indirectly through funding uh, um, and various methods of control, uh, they are now using their media to basically advocate Zionist principles and scenarios for the Arab-Israeli question. And there is certainly normalization that is being practiced in all those Gulf countries. Uh, Saudi Arabia has now exchanged visits with the State of Israel, and uh, some of that relationship is secret, some of it is not. And they also have, they say they share an enemy. I mean, in Arab media, controlled by Saudi Arabia and UAE and uh, Qatar even, there is more hostility to Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, that's not the case in Qatar, which still uh, supports rhetorically at least Hamas, but much less than before. There is more hostility to Iran and Hezbollah than there is to Israel. There is a very mild and friendly language to, toward the state of Israel. The, Suffering of the Palestinian is not what it used to be. Uh, the state of Kuwait is different. The Palestinians lived in Kuwait in large numbers prior to 1990, and they infused the political culture of Kuwait with element of justice and sympathy for the Palestinians. You see Kuwait today is deviating away from the Gulf countries in terms of normalization. Uh, but certainly what is being cooked by this administration in terms of the historic deal, as they call it, uh, between Israel and its enemies is basically nothing less than legitimization of Israeli occupation and the abandonment of Jerusalem as a capital for the Palestinian in a small mini state that is too small for the Palestinian aspiration anyway. And they basically want any facade of peace 
uh, to allow for full and official recognition and normalization between Israel and Arab countries. I thank you so much for joining us today. I've been speaking with uh, Professor Assad Abu Khalil. He's a leading expert in Middle East politics and a professor of political science at California State University in um, Stanislaus. He regularly writes at the website, The Angry Arab News Service. I thank you so much for joining us today.